Mr. Bracken? Here. Mr. Ellerby? Here. Ms. French? Here. Mr. Feather? Here. Vice Mayor Here. Okay, we'll start the pledge of allegiance. Okay. Pledge of allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. authorizing the city manager to enter into an agreement with Southeastern Equipment Company Incorporated for the purchase of specified equipment listed in the source well contract number 032119CNH dated November 17 of 2022 for an amount not to exceed $237,005.98. We have a motion to adopt. So moved. Second. Second. Good evening. 
uh, city council's approved uh, <coughs> capital replacement budget. There's $240,000 budgeted for this machine. Uh, this is a uh, large articulating loader that's used uh, across all of our divisions. It's a very important machine for our operations. Uh, what we're proposing to buy is a uh, twin to what we have currently, uh, just a modern model. Uh, we don't expect to receive delivery of this until the third quarter. Uh, once we receive delivery of the new machine, we'll come back to council to ask for permission to dispose of the old unit, either by electronic auction or uh, trade into the dealer where we feel we can get the best deal. So I'd be glad to answer any questions. Does anyone from the public wish to make a comment? Seeing none, council discussion? Just be interested what the lifetime is of the company. Uh, approximately 10 to 15 years, depending on how much use it gets. I guess I would also just note that it's um, for those of us, those of you in the public who follow the kind of things that the city has to budget for while we're trying to do some like high minded social priorities over here, we also need a piece of equipment to move stuff. And these and so some of the basic operational functions of the city are, are important and not they, they're a big part of our budget, two hundred and thirty seven thousand dollars is a lot of equipment. Um, so we'll use it for a long time and it seems like so you'll use it wastewater Water distribution, for the all of our utilities, it's used to load salt. Uh, we use it for our composting facility. Uh, it's used city water. Thank you. Okay. So we're going to have a public comment on this item. fourth and final piece of legislation for the our curb gutter sidewalk assessment program. So property owners with deficiencies were uh, notified early in the year and were given the opportunity to uh, replace <coughs> their deficient curb gutter or sidewalk. Uh, the city then authorized the contract for those that uh, did not make the improvements. Uh, with the last resolution of actual costs, there were 34 properties there we're going to be assessed. Uh, since that time, 11 have paid, so we're down to only 23 properties. So that's a pretty good number given the, uh, the number that we started with back in February. Uh, owners can uh, pay this bill through their taxes over five years at 5% interest, uh, or they can still pay within 30 days of the passage of this ordinance. I'll be glad to answer questions. Okay, are there any public comments? An ordinance repealing the November 2008 Oxford Comprehensive Plan and all the amendments thereto and adopting a new comprehensive plan entitled Oxford Tomorrow. Okay. Good evening, Council Members. I'm delighted to bring to you a comprehensive plan recommendation for our planning commission. So this is what it looks like. Um, and there's the previous one, even though they look very similar in size. They're a lot different on the inside. Um, and I'll be introducing our consultants to you. Uh, but before that, uh, I wanted to give kudos to city planner Zachary Moore, who coordinated this project and got it started for us on the staff side back two years ago. And then uh, in October of 2021, MKSK, was authorized by City Council to be our consultant to help us get this project over the finish line. And so we're very delighted with uh, their work. And um, I will say that there are 162 planning recommendations in the new plan. There were 254 in the previous plan. And there are a lot, there's a lot of difference between them, even though the numbers are also different. Uh, so um, future land use map is a big part of that, uh, that we hope to be working more directly in specifically on with the Planning Commission and hopefully with surrounding jurisdictions. Uh, there are some new elements that weren't in the previous plan as well. So we're 
happy uh, where it's at. We're very happy with the public input and the steering team, the steering committee that helped with that, the boards and commissions. It was a very engaging process. So I'll turn it over to Sarah, Sarah Lilly with MKSK. tomorrow comprehensive plan to you all tonight. Um, so I, Sam did a great um, introduction. I'll just quickly go through some slides. Um, a lot of this will be a repeat from what was presented at Planning Commission and at our last public meeting. So, um, but feel free to stop me if you want uh, further clarification or if you have any questions. Um, so firstly, I just want to emphasize that the Oxford Tomorrow Comprehensive Plan is truly a community-driven vision for the future of Oxford over the next 10 years and beyond. Um, we engaged community members through a number of different methods uh, throughout the process. Over 800 members of the Oxford community uh, participated in the process. Um, and I'll just, I'll just make a note that the page numbers up to the top right of these slides correspond to where the information is in the full um, plan document if you're following along there. Uh, so we did hold three key public input sessions, the last of which happened in November. These really built on one another and involved a lot of uh, activities along the way to gather input. And there were also corresponding online ways for folks to participate who couldn't attend in person. And we really had great levels of participation throughout this process, which is pretty unique given that COVID was still, is still very much um, present and we were able to engage folks in person and digitally and virtually um, to really have a robust engagement. And a lot of the comments we heard were transformed directly into the plan recommendations that you see before you. So the plan is, is really laid out according to the framework that you see here. And like Sam mentioned, there are 162 uh, actions which take the form of policies, projects, and programs that the city and, and partners can implement um, over the course of the plan's life. And those actions will really vary um, in terms of their complexity and their cost and their scale. And we really also wanted to focus on calling attention to um, the difference between how the city can control versus influence certain plan recommendations. So we know that you know, the city staff and boards and commissions won't be able to do, accomplish everything alone in this plan, that it's gonna require a lot of collaboration with institutions, with Miami University, with other public agencies to really achieve this. So we really try to call out the things that are directly within the city's control and then with, that are within your influence. Um, so that's something I would call attention to in this plan. Um, we also, uh, with the community's help and feedback, we refined and created this vision statement that you see here, which is really a broad aspirational statement that sets the tone for this plan and who Oxford wants to be as a community over the next 10 years. So um, we want to focus on being a vibrant community that is welcoming to all, that um, has you know, the values that are listed in this vision statement of equity and inclusion, environmental sustainability, fiscal responsibility, having lots of housing and job opportunities, um, and so on. So it's really, it's kind of sets the tone for the plan. And then we get into the eight plan goals, um, which describe a desired outcome over the next 10 years. So uh, Oxford tomorrow will be a, a sustainable Oxford. Oxford tomorrow will have housing opportunities for everyone and so on. And the plan itself, the plan document is organized into four chapters. The really the bulk of the plan is going to be in that chapter three, the recommendations. Uh, the first chapter sets kind of essential background information. The second chapter summarizes who we talked to and what we heard in the community engagement process. And then that recommendations chapter is really the meat of the plan where you'll find all of the goals, objectives, and actions across the eight topics that are covered in the plan. And then the implementation section is probably what I imagine most of you all will be referencing um, most often, it's really kind of a summary of everything that's in the plan um, in a nice kind of concise matrix. So like Sam mentioned, the future land use is, uh, map 
is a really essential part of the comprehensive plan. Um, with a comprehensive plan, we're asking how do we, what do we want future growth to look like? Um, and the land use character types that you see on the screen, there's 12 of them, really seek to answer that question, how we want Oxford to look and feel um, across the different land uses that are present in the community. Uh, a lot of these are existing and already um, are really exemplary in the community. Preserves and green space, we heard a lot about how that's really a key um, community attribute for Oxford and the high quality preserves and parks and green spaces. A lot of these will be pretty self-explanatory when you look at them, like campus is pretty self-explanatory, rural is pretty self-explanatory, and there's really kind of a, a handful that we kind of focused in on as being areas of opportunity maybe going forward for future development and redevelopment. So that um, pink category, the mixed use center, uh, employment corridor, employment center, and urban neighborhood, I would call attention to as being kind of key areas where maybe we think about the land use looking a bit different in the future um, for, those, for those land use character types. And a lot of why land use is so significant is because it does relate a lot to other topics in the plan and really can help the city to accomplish a lot of its other goals um, including housing goals, providing housing opportunities for everyone, for all, um, of you know, diversifying uh, the local tax base and local employment opportunities through focusing on those employment uses. So it's really a key section of the comprehensive plan. And the map is really showing where we see those future land uses um, being uh, present in Oxford over, over the future. So um, also with, and within the future land use map, you'll see five hatched areas. Those are focus areas, as we call them in the plan. And these are really areas where they might require a bit additional study or additional planning work to understand um, how they might change over the, over the short and long term. And, um, maybe the land uses that are shown underneath those hatches might be reimagined in the future. So, um, really quickly, at our last public meeting, we held a prioritization activity where we showed the public all 162 actions in the plan, and we asked them to um, choose the ones, the five per topic that were most important to them, um, and that results in. 40 actions out of the 162 that are maybe a good first place to start um, for you all, for staff, for boards and commissions, a good first place to look at for implementation. Um, so these are the five uh, recommendations on each of these slides are those priorities that we heard about. Um, the priorities for the land use and development section were really, a lot of them were kind of broad <coughs> policy statements or kind of value statements, um, making sure that new developments include ample green space, um, favoring kind of urban qualities over more auto-oriented designs, um, allowing for adaptive reuse, um, things like that. So they're really kind of value statements. The mobility priorities were not super surprising to me, having heard a lot of these um, priorities throughout the process of, you know, people are really excited about the potential for Amtrak. Um, people really recognize some of the barriers of the rail and the truck route that goes through uptown. Um, so wanting to find alternatives for those uh, traffic barriers. Wanting to make sure that we treat pedestrians and cyclists with equal importance to vehicles. And um, we heard a lot about how much people love the Oxford area trail system, so wanting to really continue to focus on that as a priority for the city in completing that loop. So these were, uh, again, not super surprising to me, um, but good to see them reiterated as priorities. We did hear a lot about housing throughout the process. It's a big concern for communities everywhere right now. Um, and so the, the priorities that came out of the exercise, um, I think really, provide tangible ways that the city can work to um, improve that housing diversity and housing affordability within Oxford moving forward. 
So things like allowing for potentially increased density and diversity of housing types and living arrangements, um, identifying where we might allow for more accessory dwelling units, um, supporting housing that uh, for uh, people experiencing homelessness or other crises where you might need more supportive and transitional housing. Um, so these are all really kind of tangible programs or policies that the city can address, um, work to address the housing issues that we heard about. Uh, in terms of economic development, um, these a lot of these are things you're already doing well, like supporting local entrepreneurship, creating activities and events that drive economic impact. So it's reiterating the importance of those existing um, programs and recommendations while maybe adopting um, or creating an economic development strategic plan that might create uh, identify more kind of targeted incentives that the city can use to attract new businesses and workforce to Oxford. Sustainability is kind of a, one of the more robust uh, topics within this plan. It is kind of a new sort of standalone section within the Oxford Tomorrow Comprehensive Plan. And a lot of the actions in that section really correlate to some of the community, or the climate action planning work that's being done as well in the community. Um, so a lot of these, you'll see some, some uh, alignment between the climate action plan and the Oxford Tomorrow <coughs> Plan in emphasizing the need for alternative energy within Oxford, for um, creating climate, or creating resilient um, buildings and um, creating a resilient community, and also creating, or continuing to create a more green community through street trees and um, green infrastructure, things like that. The culture and recreation section, uh, again, people love the parks and green spaces and recreation amenities in Oxford, and so we wanna continue to focus on um, investing in those systems. So one of the things we heard a lot about that the community is interested in is the development of a community center that can provide year-round recreation opportunities as well as other community and social services. Um, developing programming and continuing to improve access to parks, um, physical and otherwise, through trails and um, also just promotion of the parks and green spaces in Oxford. Uh, the community well-being chapter is also a new term for this comprehensive plan, but it's, it encompasses a lot of ideas that are not new to Oxford, including diversity, equity, and inclusion, public safety, um, public health. So it's really kind of an umbrella topic that covers a lot within it. Um, so we heard a lot in our early uh, engagement about the need for more child care and elder care and also mental health services. So I think we see that here with the priorities that are listed on the slide, um, as well as a couple others. So um, making sure we're working with the university on key kind of social and community issues is a big one. Uh, so this is, again, kind of a new topic, but it covers a lot of things that we've discussed in previous plans as well. And then lastly is the utilities section, um, which may not be sound as exciting as the others, but it's certainly just as important, um, if not more so. We know that uh, utilities and infrastructure really make the rest of the city work. So um, some of these, again, won't be new to you all, um, and they weren't new to the community either. We heard about wanting to make sure that we're expanding broadband access in, the, in Oxford and even the broader region. Um, this could even benefit Oxford in terms of economic development for allowing more remote workers here. Um, we heard about water quality and through the water softening uh, project as well as making sure that lead water pipes are not existent anymore in the community. And then also making sure we're protecting water quality at the source through stream corridor protections as well as low impact development. So I flew through that really quickly. So again, if you have any questions, feel free um, to ask them. But I'll just quickly um, kind of touch on this idea of plan stewardship, which we really cover in that fourth chapter, the implementation chapter of the plan. And this is really 
something that we tried to emphasize pretty heavily, uh, that this isn't a plan that's just gonna sit on the shelves, that this plan really starts actually with the adoption of it, and the work really begins from there. So we wanna make sure that the Oxford Tomorrow Comprehensive Plan is um, aligned and integrated with all the other work that's going on in the community from some supplementary plans, as we call them, that might uh, come out of this work, so, or are already happening, like the Climate Action Plan, like the Parks and Recreation Master Plan, uh, Transportation Plan Update, and Focus Area Plans. Uh, we want to make sure that the Comprehensive Plan is working with the city's existing regulatory tools and any updates to those regula regulations that need to happen. Um, to make sure that they're aligned with the comprehensive plan. And then any ongoing kind of um, government efforts like budgeting and the capital improvement plan and things like that. So we really try to emphasize that integration with all of those efforts in that fourth chapter, as well as how the plan can be used throughout the year, um, throughout the yearly kind of government cycle really of all the different efforts that go on to make sure that the city's running properly. So, you know, the plan can be brought out at the annual council retreat to help you all establish your priorities for the year. The plan can be used by staff when doing kind of research, policy development, budget design. Um, we want to make sure that we allow room for public input in this process, that we make sure that the budget and the comprehensive plan are aligned. Um, and we also want to make sure that there's regular reporting on progress on the comprehensive plan, a mid-year and end-year report on what we've achieved um, throughout the course of the year. So with that continuous plan use and monitoring, we think it'll be uh, a really effective plan for you all. So that's a very brief presentation tonight. <laughs> okay. I kind of flew through that, but. No, that was great. Right. Is there any public comments on this? Seeing none, council discussion? Well, I'll start by somebody who is um, who believes in planning, not just because I love a good plan, and this is a beautiful plan, but because of the process that's behind it. Um, I think all of us come on to council, and we run for office, and we're representatives, and we think we know what the people are thinking, but it's hard to know, because it might just be the people you're friends with on Facebook or that you talk to. What's wonderful about a plan is like it's really a barometer of 800 plus people participating. We have really wide participation, and it turns out that it affirms a lot of the things that we already were working on, which is really good, but also clarifies some new directions of what the people say they want us to do. So I'm, um, I'm always, I really want to thank all the people who, who uh, participated in this. Um, obviously, you know, started with staff. Um, it's been really great collaboration internally. Zach's not here, but community development, the city um, manager's office, everybody. MKSK has done a really phenomenal job with this. The steering committee, all the people who showed up for how many different steering committee meetings did we have? Nine. Or, oh, nine, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and all those people who came out to Zoom meetings and public meetings, um, you know, I think it's a sign that people believe in the exercise of planning, about thinking about the future. So Jessica says, like, what well, is Oxford's a small town, but it thinks big, you know? I mean, this is a, this is a really bold plan that sets really broad goals. So, so thanks to everybody who participated in it. Um, I think what this does, though, is it turns, like, the onus around on us, meaning council and staff, because, I mean, we had, we had a really great plan in 2008, I felt, but we didn't really have, and I wasn't on council at the time, was an infrastructure necessarily to, to take it up and, and to implement. Okay, so by the time a certain amount of time had gone on, no one was talking about the comprehensive plan at all. Um, so I think what, but I, what I feel, and this is my kind of promise to the public, is that while we've been working on developing a plan, we've been working really hard to develop the plan, the strategic planning framework to implement it. So everything we've been doing in our retreats, and, and we never had annual reports before, and you know, we have annual reports, and we have metrics, and, and, and so the idea of taking these broad goals Using them in our retreat in a few weeks, setting annual priorities, um, you know, I think that we're in a much better position to implement it. Um, the one thing that, when I, I love the diagram of 137, the one thing that I think I want to also emphasize though is that our, our boards and commissions are going to be really key to this. Some things are going to be like budget items that we need to pay for, but sometimes there are <coughs> ideas that come out of them. It's legislation or initiatives that come out of our boards and commissions. So I really look forward to us 
setting our priorities and then sitting down with our boards of commissions to like figure out what do you guys want us to work on, how can we work on it together, and tap like the amazing, I'm looking at Katie and Ann out there, people like amazing energy and resources so that the process continues to feed on, it, uh, on itself. So thanks to everybody who's involved and to council for supporting the budget for this or finding money in the budget for this, Doug, and for all the staff time and resources. Um, I think it's a good investment, but again, the onus is now on us to make sure the dividends flow from it. So. Um, I can build on that. I think this is the third or fourth time I've seen an approximation of this presentation, and I'm excited about it every time, which I think speaks volumes to the hard work that you all at MKSK have done, the hard work that city staff has done. <clears throat> and one of the things that I'm most excited to see reflected in this plan is Every public input session, people were there, people were excited, people were telling you, good, bad, or otherwise, what they thought about the city and the direction we want to go in. And I can feel it, I can see it reflected in the plan. So I'm excited to vote for it in two weeks. And again, I just want to say thank you to the public for participating wholeheartedly in this process, for city staff and for MKSK, um, and everybody else who's worked behind the scenes really hard to bring a super new, exciting plan to fruition. So thank you. So we will move on to our first and only second reading. An ordinance by Oxford City Council authorizing the city manager to take all necessary action necessary, including but not limited to the negotiation and execution of a contract to purchase real estate located at 100 South Elm Street and 102 South Elm Street at a cost of $600,000 for all parcels and to utilize American Rescue Plan Act funds in making this purchase. We have a motion to adopt. So moved. Second. I don't have any additional information um, from the last meeting, but I'm here to answer any questions that you have. Thank you. Thank you. Any public comments? Seeing none, council discussion? Yes, I just wanted to address, and maybe you can talk about this too, that we got received an email for someone who's kind of asking, why this property? Why now? And what, you know, and I, and I guess I was, I was thinking about this, that um, one of the things that the city is doing is kind of being entrepreneurial, which is when you see an opportunity, you go for it. Um, and so, and, and maybe you can address this, Jessica, I mean, the question, well, why Elm Street? And I think Elm Street, think about the plan, we know Elm Street today, but I think that corridor has a lot of potential to be something different and really productive for us in the future. So it's it's actually identified in our plan as kind of an area for redevelopment. And what redevelopment means is 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 you know, but but also the idea that sometimes well, why these structures? Well, because you have an opportunity and you can act on it. Uh, so I don't, you know, I, I think that um, I really appreciate that this is both like far reaching, thinking like of all the places, Elm Street's a good place to invest, but but B, wow, there's an opportunity, let's jump on it. And and I don't know whether I mean, I think you answered it. I mean, that's exactly it. The College at Elm is a new, exciting adventure with my university. We're going to try to bring in new jobs and new innovation. And then these properties became available immediately next door. And in our draft comprehensive plan, it said, pay attention to Elm Street. And we were like, and we have American Rescue Dollars that can be used for economic recovery. And so we were like, we should try this. And and so while we have to develop a plan still, we know that it's an area that's ripe with opportunity. It connects two major business zones, and I think it has just a real potential <coughs> for, for growth and innovation. What exactly it will look like will probably take a few years, if I'm being honest, but that's okay. We'll take our time. We'll have public input, um, we'll, you know, and then we'll, we'll go from there. So but I think exactly what you said is why we're looking at these properties. And as far as that, you know, I'm not an expert in Oxford real estate, but these seem like <coughs> relatively good price for mm -hmm. for their location and what they are. I mean, investment properties are hugely expensive, which is why people say to us, why aren't you doing what Hamilton's doing? Well, your real estate in Hamilton doesn't cost what it does here in Oxford. Um, so these are actually reasonably priced pieces of property in our market. Um, so, so thank you for having the forward thinking and also the jumping on an opportunity in the short term. And to build on that, I do want to commend Jessica and your team for doing due diligence on the number of ways that we could approach an opportunity like this. Um, I know there's been a lot of questions asked about how can we purchase property that would be used for economic purposes, and this is actually, to David's point, one of the more cost-effective ways of doing it. Uh, some of the other options would be far outside the reach of what we could have spent this money on. So in terms
terms of, wow, this seems like a lot of money, it is a lot of money, um, but it's a far cry from how much this, an idea like this could cost the city. So this is actually a very smart way to go about this type of purchase. So again, tip of the cap to the team. And along with that, I don't like to say a whole lot of stuff up here, but I have to say something <coughs> about this because of that email. <laughs> uh, we started this project four years ago when we did not rezone that property. And now look what we have. And this is just one additional step in the plan that started with the old comprehensive plan and now is in the new comprehensive plan. And, you know, council has had the same vision that entire time. And like, you know, like you just said, it's an expensive proposition. However, there are certain things that have tremendous returns on investment that are expensive. And I feel like this is a, a, a just use of city funds because the returns will be significant. Also, as a sidebar, those two houses that people tend to consider to be <laughs> residential properties are actually commercial properties and they are priced as such. When you go and do a commercial valuation of a property, you look at how much money does that thing generate and then you put a capitalization rate against it and they are appropriately priced for the capitalization rate in Oxford and where they are. So a lot of people don't realize that many buildings in Oxford that look like houses that are typically residential and they used to be are now being utilized and priced as commercial property. So that's just one of those informational things about the public. I agree with both <coughs> counselors and what they also said. It's a tremendous opportunity. Thank you guys for jumping on it. And I can't wait to vote for it. I agree with everything I've heard. I think it's an opportunity. As far as I can tell, it's fair market value, considering. Um, I just wanted to throw in my support for, everything's open, right? It's still malleable. We have no certified plans for it. Um, but that we try to incorporate housing as much as possible because I think that's more in being the economic side, even though we should be addressing all of them all. Just wanted to throw my support in for that. <coughs> Mr. Ellerby? Yes. Ms. French? Yes. Mr. Featheridge? Yes. Mr. Bracken? Yes. Vice Mayor Rayu? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so now um, announcements and presentations are done. Thank you, Vice Mayor. Uh, just a few things here. I just wanted to follow up on the proclamation that Vice Mayor Rayu read earlier from our Luther King Day. Uh, I wanted to share with the community that they do have a breakfast celebration scheduled at the Ball Ball Room in the Shriver Center at Miami University, and that will be from uh, 10 a.m. Uh, the gathering and breakfast. The program starts at 11 a.m. The keynote speaker is Dr. Carolyn Jefferson Jenkins, the 15th president of the League of Women Voters of the U.S. and recipient of the Freedom Summer 64 Award. So I just wanted to make sure that everyone was aware of that because that occurs before our next uh, council meeting. Uh, also, I want to share with the council and the community that uh, we began ma management and operation of the Oxford Cemetery uh, on January 1st. Uh, we did file the registration form with the Ohio Department of Commerce. They've accepted that and they'll be issuing our certificate. So we're gonna be meeting this week with the uh, president of the Cemetery Association to the city, so I wanted to let the council know that. Uh, last thing that I wanted to share with you, uh, it was suggested that the city meet with uh, Miami University officials and discuss the impact that the university facilities and students have on our uh, fire EMS operations, and we did that uh, before Christmas. Uh, we met with uh, Vice President David Kramer, Randy Thomas, uh, Stephen Van Winkle, and Chris Lawson of Miami University to once again discuss the impact that they have on our fire EMS operations. We shared with them that if you look at the five-year average 2017 to 2021 uh, and look at the age group, which is primarily Miami University students, uh, they represent about 28.5% of our EMS calls. And this age group is 17 to 23 years of age. 
fire calls at my <coughs> facilities, and this of course includes false alarms, uh, represent 23.5%. Uh, fire calls at student housing, and this only looks at the housing within the mile square. The fire chief went by addresses in the mile square, so this number would be higher than it actually is because it doesn't include the annex, which has a lot of students uh, and other uh, projects outside the mile square. But the number we shared with them was 19.7% of fire calls at student housing off campus. Uh, combined fire calls, which would include the ones at the facilities and student housing, about 43.12%. But overall, for that five-year period, combined fire and EMS calls <coughs> represent just under one-third of our calls for that time period, 2017-2021. So it was a good meeting. It, it, uh, was informative, I think, for both the city and Miami. Uh, they shared with us, Miami officials, the financial issues that they're, they're facing. Uh, but the bottom line was that they uh, will not be able to contribute funds for additional fire EMS staff. And so uh, we'll be scheduling a work session to discuss this with city council. And I know uh, Councilor Preathridge had suggested that we invite Miami officials to that meeting. I think that's a good idea. And also uh, the student representatives of the student body uh, for that meeting as well, because this is important that we have sufficient staffing to deal with our fire EMS calls here in Oxford. So uh, more to come on that, and that's all I have this evening, unless you have some questions for me. Thank you. Do you uh, it's probably going to come up in the work session, but do you know what percentage of students do, live outside of the Miles Square and on campus? Like, is that they surely a quarter of them, they're not all, it's not like 80% of them live within the mile square and campus. No, we don't have exact numbers there, but like I said, the number that I shared with you for the uh, student housing, that was only in the mile square, and, and uh, Chief uh, Deathridge looked at specific addresses and excluded those that have uh, uh, families in, in the mile square, but you know, it didn't include the annex, it didn't include level 27, it didn't include the gas light, several other large projects so I don't have a number but you know that number would obviously be higher than that 19.7 percent but even with the numbers that we shared with them it's still one-third of our calls and we also shared with them the revenue that we bring in to fund fire and EMS uh, income tax uh, which is a quarter percent uh, provides about 60 percent of our revenue EMS billing and collections provides about 23% of our revenue. We have a contract with Oxford Township, uh, which provides just under 6%, and then other, which includes the Milford Township contract and some other uh, smaller sources, provide about 10%. So, you know, if you just look at the income tax revenue, because as we all know, Miami is the largest employer, Miami University is the largest employer within the city of Oxford, I believe that revenue uh, percentage has been declining past several years, but even so, if you look, uh, I think it was four years ago, it was about uh, just under 50% of the income tax revenue, but you know, income tax presently doesn't cover our existing expenses. Uh, if you throw an EMS billing, uh, we're still showing a deficit, and we shared that information with them. Uh, but in 2021, we had a $100,000 deficit, and that's without buying any large equipment. In 2022, uh, we'll, we'll see soon because they'll be closing the books, but we're looking at probably a $400,000 or more deficit. So, you know, we need to address this deficit, plus we also need to address the need for additional staffing because of the volume of calls that we're dealing with. But we'll go over all that information with you in a work session uh, soon. Thank Maybe you. even encouragement to improving risky behavior might help with saving costs. Sure, but, sure. Yeah. Looking forward to it. And then did Mike leave? Uh, he's, he's, we're he's operating the we're having house. audio issues oh, tonight, okay. so he's thank our, Mike. yeah, thank you, Mike. Right. He's working the cameras <laughs> right now. <laughs> Wearing his other hand. <laughs> we just want to let council know that uh, um, this will be my last night in front of you for a while. Uh, this Saturday, I have an opportunity to go to the uh, FBI National Academy in Quantico, Virginia. I'll be gone for 10 weeks, so 
Um, I'll be there through like March 16th. So it's a great opportunity. It's one of the leading schools for law enforcement managers. So I'm thankful that City Manager Elliott uh, allowed me to go. I've been on this list for like six years now. So I'm glad I get to do it. But uh, hopefully learn some um, you know, knowledge and skills out there that I can bring back to serve the citizens of Oxford. But uh, you'll be in good hands here. Nothing tonight. <laughs> <laughs> Sam. No, thank you. Nothing. Happy New Year. Nothing, thank you. Nothing tonight. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Nothing, thank you. Not at all. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm excited to see everybody at the Chocolate Meltdown this weekend. Or no, not this weekend. That's next weekend. Thank you, Casey. Yes. I promised I was going to remember. So yes, <laughs> the 14th is the Chocolate Meltdown at the Oxford Community Arts Center and Uptown. So we look forward to see everybody there. I think the weather should be okay. Thanks. I look forward to discussing our future funding of the MS and fire. I wanted to make a special shout out to all the folks who, when this terrible weather came in before Christmas, most of us hunkered back in our houses and hoped our furnaces would keep going. But other folks were out keeping our streets as, as cleared as they could be you know, 20 degrees under which salt doesn't work anymore. Um, and our uh, fire department was, so all those people, while well, the rest of us were safe at home, other people were out in really nasty conditions trying to keep Oxford safe. Um, it seems like we came through okay, but without well, too many water break breaks and things like that, but it was like, really difficult conditions. So thanks for, to all the staff who, who kept the city going through a really tough weather period. And the, looking at the, thanks for staying. Normally people just like ditch us after they're done, so appreciate it. Uh, it's a great presentation, and it's really exciting because we have our council retreat coming up on the 20th, right? We finalized 12 to 4. So that'll be exciting for us to take all those policy and programs and really put it to paper on being creative and what we can do to work on those plans. So thank you. Okay, that being said, um, motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Aye.